You're watching NBC4. Live from the area's leading news station, this is News 4 Today. Good morning. Welcome to Viewpoint. The month of May is Asian Pacific American Heritage Month. And this morning on Viewpoint, we're going to focus on an organization called the Asian American Government Executives Network. It's called AJIN for short. And joining us to uh, conduct our discussion this morning is Mr. Tommy Wong, who is chair of mentoring and outreach for AJIN, and he's a member of the executive committee. Uh, Jim Men is executive director of AJIN and a member of the executive committee. And Belle Leong Hong is a business owner, and she's a member of the executive board. Welcome, all of you. Thank you. To Thank you. It's nice Thank to you. have you with us this morning. Why don't you start off by telling us what Ajin is and what it does? Okay, great. Um, the Ajin is a vibrant professional network uh, uh, organization, and our purpose is to expand, to promote, and to support current, present, and future. Um, Asian American leaders in at all levels of government. Um, our membership uh, reaches into local, state, and federal government. Um, uh, and we are the senior Asian American leaders and decision makers uh, across the government. And uh, our membership is made up of um, uh, um, the members in the uh, civilian workforce, the military, the you know, uh, um, in, including uh, uh, the, the legislative uh, and uh, congressional you know members as well. How large is the Asian American workforce? Uh, overall, if we look at uh, national uh, demographics, uh, year two thousand eight, uh, Asian American and the Pacific Islander constitute about 5% of the uh, entire U.S. population. And that same percentage carries into the uh, federal government approximately 5.4%. And uh, within the Defense the Department, it's about 6%. Mm -hmm. And within the Navy, it's about 10%. But overall, if there are a total, say, 2 million uh, federal workforce, and 6% of them, you know, is uh, Asian Pacific American. So uh, the work of Ajin focuses primarily, though, on executives. Yes. Uh, those at the executive levels of, of government. And how many are we talking about there? We're talking about a very, very small percentage. Um, just as a point of reference, uh, when we first started this organization back in 1994, um, we had approximately less than uh, a, a little bit over one percent. So, in the context of uh, um, 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 the, the 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 legislative number of about seventy seven hundred senior executives in federal government, the Asian American uh, executives were only a hundred of them. Today, we are a little bit under two percent. Uh, we are about a hundred, somewhere fluctuating between 120 to 140. So, uh, so there hasn't been much growth. No, not in 15 years. You know, okay. If you think about it. And 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 tell us a little more about what inspired you then. And I assume numbers like that inspired you uh, yes. to, to found this organization and what your focus is. Okay. So what inspired us is that uh, we found that. Um, there were very few of us. We needed to get to know each other, and we needed to support each other. Uh, there are networks, you know, there are women's networks, there are, you know, general's networks, there are all sorts of networks. And we found that we needed one for, you know, Asian Americans, uh, executives in government. So that was one thing. Second thing was that uh, because there were so few of us, uh, we thought that we would be able to reach out and, you know, uh, get everybody together. Um, so our focus today has evolved. Uh, earlier on, it was more of a networking um, uh, focus. Today, it is much more to try to help the younger generation of leaders uh, in, uh, in the Asian American uh, federal workforce to rise to the ranks of the senior executives. Um, and we do that by putting together programs that uh, you know, help mentor them, that uh, give them the executive skills necessary to reach the senior executives um, and to give them access to a network 
uh, of, um, of, uh, of senior executives that, have, that are either currently in government or past executives like myself. Uh, I retired about 10 years ago, but I'm still a member of this organization. <laughs> you retired, but you, you yes. haven't retired. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, we've got to take a break. Sure. We are going to continue our discussion and talk about the glass ceiling, which you call the bamboo ceiling, right. as we continue to learn more about the work of Ajahn here on Viewpoint. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Viewpoint. We're talking this morning about AGEN. That is the acronym for the Asian Pacific American, I'm sorry, <laughs> that is the acronym for the Asian American Government Executives Network. This is Asian Pacific American Heritage Month, which is right. what I was about to say. Right. Tommy Wong, uh, you chair mentoring and outreach for AGEN, but I wanted to talk a little uh, more about the glass ceiling, the reason for AGEN's existence. You call it the bamboo ceiling and the sticky floor. Right. Well. We have a slightly different term for it because for the Asian Pacific Americans, there are slightly different factors involved in breaking the, the bamboo ceiling. Uh, right now in the federal government, we're actually fairly well represented in terms of overall numbers. We're about 5% in the general population that are Asian Pacific Americans, and in the government, there's about a little bit more than 5%. However, when you look at the senior levels of government, the very top level, we're only about 2%. And if you look at the reasons why people tend to get to those levels, uh, Asian Pacific Americans are usually very well educated, and we're usually in the job categories that are considered professional administrative in government that typically get to those levels. Yet when we get to the level right before the senior levels, our numbers are around 8%, but it drops off into the 2% when we get to the senior level. So there's a big barrier and crossing that bamboo ceiling. And that's the issue that we're tackling the most. And, and again, your bamboo ceiling is the same as our glass ceiling. Yes, it is. Uh, one of the reasons, uh, I understand, is, is the myth of the model minority. This is one of the challenges uh, that you face. Explain what the myth is. Okay. Well, the myth is that um, we, are, um, we, are, we are viewed, we are perceived as being um, uh, very, um, very quiet. Uh, we don't make waves. Uh, we um, are, we, you know, we do our work without complaint. Um, and most of us expect to be recognized by the work that we do without, you know, saying, "Hey, look at me. You know, this is what I've done." Um, and so, um, so what happens is that we get passed over for promotions very easily. Uh, and sometimes those recognitions don't come that easily uh, without, you know, somebody noticing or somebody paying some attention to you. Uh, and so the, 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 and there's a myth because that's not necessarily the case, right? Um, there's also the, ca the, 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 the myth that, um, uh, that um, uh, they're not going to complain if they don't get promoted. And so that's another, you know, that another reason for being passed over. Uh, Jim, how do you work? How does the organization work to try to overcome what really amount, amounts to stereotyping? Right. Um, we, uh, we analyze uh, this issue. Ajin has been um, supporting to many of the studies of uh, this issue. Fundamentally, we boil it down to two aspects. One is our internally, uh, you know, sort of intrinsic Asian, Asian culture, uh, like everything that Bill and Tommy has mentioned, that we do need to be aware of those facts and understand the perception that it may cause at the uh, work uh, uh, place. The second part is to make our uh, management, the supervisors, um, uh, more aware of this uh, culture differences because uh, the Asian Americans uh, tend to be considered lack of uh, self-confidence or not interest in taking on um, management responsibilities. So given this uh, understanding of the root causes of the, the barriers, we have uh, put together a very aggressive uh, program to deal with uh, both the mentoring and the development of our workforce at the same time, we also build a very strong, uh, robust um, partnership with all the federal agencies 
to bring these culture differences to their awareness, to work together with them to change the perception. Um, how has diversity training uh, affected uh, your efforts? Because most companies have that now. Yeah, they do. Um, you know, the, it has helped some. It has helped some. I think that what the diversity training has done is to sensitize management to the, the fact that each of us have differences and, um, the, um, uh, and in respecting those differences, they need to you know, take that into consideration as they do their planning for advancement, for career advancements for the employees. Tommy? Well, part of the contribution of Arjun is being at the table. So recently, OPM, for instance, has put together a workforce to develop a diversity strategic plan for all the government. And Arjun had members at the table to try to help develop that plan. Uh, we also had discussions with uh, Kiran Huja at the White House for the White House Initiative on Asian American Pacific Islanders to help shape that program. So part of where Arjun is coming in is being at the table and help define some of these programs and, and trying to change some of the uh, differences and make the awareness of the cultural differences. Be All right, we've got to take a break, okay. but we'll be right back to continue our talk. Stay with us.